we've kind of got things a bit backwards. We're looking at our weight as being a marker of our health. And in fact, strength is a marker of health. If you're at a lower weight, but you have lower muscle mass, you're actually at higher risk for all-cause mortality. I used to joke that, you know, if exercise came in a pill, then everybody would take it. Welcome to the Strength Changes Everything podcast, where we introduce you to the information, latest research, and tools that will enable you to live a strong, healthy life. On this podcast, we will also answer your questions about strength, health, and well-being. I'm Amy Hudson. I own and operate three exercise coach studios. My co-hosts are Brian Sagan, co-founder and CEO of The Exercise Coach, and Dr. James Fisher, leading researcher in evidence-based strength training. And now for today's episode. Hey, everyone. It's Amy and Dr. Fisher with you today. We are answering a question that has come in that's a very common one on the topic of GLP-1s. You may have heard of this and you may have know people that are taking GLP-1s. So today in this episode, we're going to go through what these are, um, you know, how they work, the prevalence of the use and some factors to consider when, you know, thinking about this um, as a means to weight loss. Hey, Dr. Fisher, how are you doing? I'm doing great, Amy. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. So um, GLP-1, this is a hot button issue and we are going to dive right in. So first of all, can you tell us a little bit about GLP-1s? I mean, what are they and, and how do they work? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a, a hugely contemporary topic in uh, in both the US and the UK um, as far as a weight loss drug. Um, but it's worth kind of taking a step back, uh, both for perspective and back in time. So uh, GLP-1 is glucagon-like peptide 1, and that's a naturally occurring hormone um, that helps control blood sugar levels. Um, and it was originally developed, the, the GLP-1 receptor agonist, so the medication itself, was originally developed for diabetics to help the body produce more insulin, uh, reduce the amount of, of sugar, uh, of blood sugar, I should say, um, which can be really bad for diabetics. So it can cause sort of organ damage and you know, peripheral neuropathy, uh, diabetic retinopathy. So uh, you know, diabetes can cause a lot of problems. So it's a really important type of medication. Um, that is, of course, uh, FDA approved and is, you know, a, a genuine pharmaceutical product. So they were originally developed then to for as a drug for diabetes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. OK, so then talk us through how did they get into more of the mainstream? I mean, people are taking these now that are not diabetics. So walk us through how this drug has evolved. <laughs> Yeah. So as with most, uh, with, with, well, with many pharmaceuticals, certainly, um, there is a, a secondary effect of certain types of medication. And in this case, there, there was identified, you know, considerable weight loss in diabetics uh, using GLP-1 uh, receptor agonists. Um, so it, it's become, and it's been used for about 20 years in the pharmaceutical industry for diabetics. And then more recently, it's been recognized and prescribed for uh, specifically for weight loss. Um, now, wh whether it should or shouldn't be prescribed for weight loss is, you know, is debatable, but it, it certainly is being prescribed and it certainly seems efficacious for weight loss. Um, but we'll talk a bit about some of the, the potential implications of that. Right. I mean, I think from the beginning of time, people have wanted some kind of pill or magic magic uh, potion for weight loss, right? So if something uh, comes out that suggests that it might be that solution, it's going to gain in popularity, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the reality is the, the pharmaceutical industry is, is a business. Uh, as much as we might like to think that it's purely virtuous and it's there purely for our own health and well-being, it's, it's a, it's a money-making business. Um, and of course, they've realized that there's a lot more money to be made in helping people to lose weight than there is purely in helping diabetics. There's a lot more people trying to lose weight than there are diabetics uh, to take it. So, uh, so it's come across that way. And of course, you know, like you said, um, you know, if there's a pill for it, then uh, then people people will take it if if it's uh, if it's an easier option. Um, I used to joke that you know, if exercise came in a pill, then everybody would take it. So. Uh, it's a it's a tricky one. 
Yes. Do you have any facts or figures about how how common this is or how how many people are using it currently? Yeah, so if we, if we go back over time over the last sort of decade it's gone from around uh 30,000 to just shy of uh, a million people here in the US and and that equates to uh somewhere around 7% of adults uh currently taking or having claimed to have taken uh, GLP-1 medication f- specifically for weight loss. So it it's got a reasonably high prevalence. Um now, of course, it does list in in the uh, in the packaging. It should list the side effects. Uh, and from the people that I've spoken to who have taken GLP one medication, um, there are sort of gastrointestinal side effects as well as headaches, dizziness, fatigue, uh, and so forth. A few other side effects as well. Now, it's worth clarifying: uh, a, a lot of medication has a side effect. So this is not uh, this is not for us to. Uh, be berating GLP-1 use, of course, it, it, you know, if it's used for a genuine reason, I think that it's, uh, this is a more of an education for people. Mm-hmm. So just to clarify, so how it works is that it, it helps to regulate insulin levels in the body, right? Does it decrease mm-hmm. appetite? Yeah, it does. So it slows digestion down. And it reduces appetite. Of course, the slowing of digestion is what might cause gastrointestinal issues. And in fact, um, people who are physically fit and healthy and, and specifically engage in strength training actually increase their gastrointestinal transit time. And that can serve to reduce certain types of cancer, sort of gastrointestinal cancer. So I don't know that we necessarily want to slow our digestion. But in this case, it does slow our digestion and it reduces appetite. And that, of course, is why people feel full for longer and therefore they don't feel the same appetite to eat and, and they had, hence they end up losing weight. So what are potential long-term or do we know any long-term potential effects of being on this drug for a while? Yeah, so I had a bit of a search around for this and, and there's not there's really not much detailed about what the long-term effects of the use of GLP-1 receptor agonists um, is for, for the lay population or, or even for diabetics. So I presume there are trials that have been done, but certainly they're, they're not that easy to uncover at this stage. So now there are long-term side effects of a lot of medications, so it would be remiss of us to think that there are no long-term effects, but how severe they are, we, uh, we simply can't talk about yet. Okay, so what would be, you know, so this is a good foundation um, for what these drugs are, how they work, um, you know, how they may help somebody short-term lose weight, but, you know, what would be some factors to consider if somebody w- wanted to lose weight um, and was looking at this as an option? Yeah, so this is the big question, and this is the the point of real concern from my perspective, um, and that is that uh, rapid weight loss, uh, especially without exercise, uh, causes a, a weight loss where about around 50% of that weight loss is muscle mass, um, and around 50% of it is, of course, fat mass. Now, the fat mass is the intent. That's what people are trying to lose. But, but of course, when we talk about weight, people aren't necessarily dissociating between muscle mass and fat mass. They're simply looking at the scales and saying, hey, I lost 10 pounds. They're not thinking about the, the disastrous implications of I lost five pounds of muscle. So as soon as somebody is thinking about a weight loss program and especially is considering the use of any weight loss medication, especially uh, including and especially GLP-1 receptor agonists, for me, I think the key thing is to get strength training kind of ticked off, make sure that's a, um, a regular uh, occurrence in that person's lifestyle so that they're either building or retaining as much muscle as they can. And then from there, and of course, that will lead to some fat loss as well. Uh, And from there, to then consider any kind of weight loss medication as well. By doing so, they can hold on to as much muscle as they can uh, and retain the muscle that they've already got. And hopefully, the weight that they lose uh, as a product of taking that kind of medication will be predominantly fat. So that's the, the, the priority from my perspective. Yes. And we've talked about this a lot of uh, a lot on this podcast and on other episodes. But if this is somebody's first episode that they're listening to us on the Strength Changes Everything podcast, can you just remind us, I mean, what 
are the negative consequences of somebody going and losing weight and losing muscle mass. So picture somebody a year from today having lost, like you just said, 50% muscle mass on some kind of a diet. What what is the negative uh, outcome that they might not realize could happen? Uh, absolutely. So, so the key thing is that muscular strength and, and muscle mass are predictors of are, are clear predictors of quality of life uh, uh, as we age, and also reduction in all cause mortality. Um, there's a we, we've talked about on a previous episode. I think it was the episode where we talked about no non responders to uh, resistance type exercise. Um, and there's, a, there's something called a fat but fit paradigm. And basically, that paradigm says that, and the reason it's called a paradigm is because it's counterintuitive. But w w what that uh, kind of profile says is that it's better to be overweight and strong than it is to be normal weight and weak or, or unfit. And that's a really important message. And, and to me, that's exactly what lends itself to this, this concept of taking kind of weight loss medication. Uh, before engaging in strength training is we've kind of got things a bit backwards. We're looking at our weight as being a marker of our health. And, and in fact, weight is not a marker of our health. Strength is a marker of health. Muscle mass is a marker of health. They're the, the clear two indicators for quality of life and all cause mortality. And in fact, there was a, a study a few years back that looked at muscle mass index and body mass index. And it even showed that the people with the, the lower body mass index, which is what most people would think about as being uh, a marker of health, um, the people with the lowest body mass index actually had the highest mortality rate because they also had the lowest muscle mass index, whereas people with the highest body mass index had the highest muscle mass index and therefore had the lowest mortality rate. And, and I know that you're about to explain what body mass index is, Amy, because I didn't do that. So <laughs> I'll leave that to you. Yes, this is, but that is a, a huge, important, eye-opening truth. If you, if you haven't heard that before, is that it's very easy to, to take weight as an indication of how healthy I am. But what Dr. Fisher just said is that um, the... If you're at a lower weight, but you have lower muscle mass or not enough muscle mass, you're actually at higher risk for all-cause mortality. So it's not the first metric to look at. The, the metric of success really is our muscle mass, which isn't um, what the scale will tell us, a regular scale, right? So that's why it's important to know what our muscle mass is. We have bioimpedance devices, and we've talked about that on a Smart Scales uh, podcast in the past to get to know what that is. Or at Exercise Coach Studios, we offer body composition readings. But yeah, BMI is a standard metric of, of um, you know, you you can pull up on Google Charts and you can see normal weight, healthy weight, and then another range is overweight, and then another range is obese, right? And um, it's it, a BMI is just a straight up marker of uh, height and weight, but that doesn't tell the whole story, right? So what Dr. Fisher is saying is somebody might be at a, a higher weight because they have more muscle mass and truly metabolically they're way healthier than somebody who might be five or 10 pounds lighter in the normal weight category, right? Or in another category on this BMI chart. But really more muscle mass is every single day of the week more advantageous. Exactly, exactly. Really well put. Um, but I, I would even go a step further than that and say even people that think of themselves as being overweight or obese uh, and, and might physically be obese have more, mu potentially have more muscle mass because of carrying around that additional weight. So if they go on a weight loss strategy uh, to try to lose some of that body fat, then that, that's, that's fine. You know, fat loss is okay. I, I'm not for a second saying that people shouldn't try to lose body fat if, they're, if they are uh, carrying an excess. But muscle loss is absolutely disastrous. And, and that's the key thing in all of this. Uh, we need to hang on to and build as much muscle as we can because that's the biggest marker for quality of life as we age. And you've said in other podcasts, Dr. Fisher, uh, some statistics about when people yo-yo diet within a year of, of losing um, weight, where 50% of that is muscle mass and 50% of that is body fat, a certain percentage of people regain all the weight. What mm -hmm. was that stat? 
Yeah. So I, I don't remember the exact statistic, but most people will regain all of the weight that they lost, but half of it, it half of the weight they lost was muscle, but they won't regain the muscle that they lost. So we know that most people lose, uh, you know, a, a, a reasonably high percentage, sort of one to five percent every decade of life of, of muscle mass. Um, and if we if we're just giving it away because we're going on a, a drastic weight loss diet, that's you know we're, we're we're quite literally aging our body ten years. If I lose you know five or ten pounds of muscle, I'm effectively aging my body. Um, you know, unnecessarily, uh, you know, with the intention that I'm trying to do myself some good. And this is the point of this. This is educational, right? We're mm -hmm. not trying to tell people not to lose weight and not to, uh, not to take certain medication. Um, but we are trying to help people to make a more educated decision. Absolutely. Yeah. So the, the point being is that we have to care for our muscle mass in, this has to be a part of the conversation related to weight loss um, is preserving muscle mass so that metabolically we are healthier for the long term. Um, we want to keep the long term perspective in mind and how healthy will I be in one year or five years, not just in six months. And muscle mass is the is the key piece to consider when it comes to this. Yeah, I was just going to add that we've talked about um, the benefits of strength training in other ways as well. But we've also talked about the the approach to strength training as being, you know, can be relatively you know, complicated, can be brief, can be infrequent, you know, exactly as the exercise coach prescribed. Um, so it doesn't have to be that, oh, I, I want to take this medication to lose weight and I haven't got the time to go to the gym five or six days a week. That's not what's being advocated at all. Um, you know, getting strength training as part of a, a weekly routine, as part of a lifestyle habit is, is relatively palatable. Um, you know, so maybe maybe people need to go back and listen through some other podcasts. Absolutely. You know, this was a this was a very important thing to um, to touch on, and I'm so glad we did. Um, do you have any other thoughts on this that we didn't get to in this episode? No, I, th I think we hit everything there, Amy. Thank you. Well, thank you for teaching us on this. Um, this is an evolving topic, as always. So I'm sure it'll be one we'll revisit again on the podcast. We. Um, you know, we you you know that our position on strength is that it is uh, the number one thing that we want to focus on for our overall health and well-being. And so we hope that that is something that you take away from this episode today. We will see you next time on the podcast. Hope you remember, strength changes everything. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with a friend. You can submit a question or connect with the show at strengthchangeseverything.com. Join us next week for another episode and be sure to follow the show on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts so that you never miss another episode. Here's to you and your best health.